six o'clock, and I am going to open the um, Board of Selectmen's workshop um, meeting for interview purposes. Tonight we have Peter Caruso in front of us, and um, we have no structured formal, you know, but we will be giving you questions as each of us finds important and pertinent to the town. Um, I appreciate our correspondence and discussions prior to coming here. Um, so I guess the first question is, why Millville? Well, Millville <laughs> it interested me because um, you're a small town, part of a regional school system, and I lived for many years in a small town, part of a regional school system, Sherburne. Now, Sherburne's a different town in that, in some ways, because the taxes are three or four times higher than they are here. So it's a, it's a different community. But nonetheless, it's got a lot of open space. You have a lot of open space. You have challenges. I like challenges. Um, I'm trying to switch from the private sector into the public sector, you know, in this type of role. And I thought, geez, I could add value to what you're trying to do here. It seems that a lot of the challenges you face, I have a lot of familiarity with. When, when I was in Sherburne, I spent a lot of time as the liaison to the regional schools, uh, both for our finance committee, which we called advisory committee, and for the Board of Selectmen. So I, I got to know in great depth how budgets and the challenges that the schools face uh, uh, work. And I think the superintendents came to respect the fact that I was asking important questions that needed answers and that they respected that, gee, this is, I was supportive once I was, I understood how things were. So I could be supportive, but perhaps a little challenging in terms of digging in and making sure I understood how things work on behalf of the residents of Sherburn. Uh, so Millville, you have challenges. In my private life, I've done turnarounds. And uh, so I like the idea of learning, trying to find better ways, and, uh, and also helping people from different stripes understand what the possibilities are. And I think, you know, having watched some of your meetings and so forth, I think, you know, sometimes you, it's not that you need a referee, but you, you, you need somebody that can help with clarity. And I think I, I have, a, have, have an ability to do that. I've worked on a contentious board of selectmen when I first got on board there, and uh, things worked out well. We, we all started pulling our oars in the same direction. Uh, we approached things with professionalism, um, congeniality, uh, collegiality, um, but we also didn't always see eye to eye, and I think the town was better for it. And I think, you know, you're in a position right now where that might be helpful. What's the other thing? I, I'm friendly with, uh, no, not, I'm not, I guess I'm friendly is the right word. I'm, I've worked with the town administrator in Blackstone, so I know Dan Keyes very well. He I was a town that. administrator in Sherburne, and uh, I've spoken to him a couple of times now since uh, I, I got involved here. And he, you know, when I first mentioned it to him, he said, what do you have, rocks in your head? Like, <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> but, Yet you're but, still here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm still here. And, you know, I know Dan well enough to know that he, and he knows me well enough to know that, you know, neither of us are going to be BSing each other. That's one way to put it. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think your town could benefit by working together with the other community to the extent that can be done. And, uh, you know, I think maybe I could help in that effort. Um, I did enjoy, and I have great appreciation for your your uh, search committee. Um, it, I think your town was well represented by all those people. It was a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of questions. Uh, but I felt comfortable in that group. So, you know, there's another part of it. Do you feel comfortable amongst the people? And uh, I felt I did. Um, and I, again, very appreciative of their efforts that they were putting in. Okay. Anyone? So you spoke about um, you've worked in a um, school system where it's a uh, regional school system. Obviously, we're in a regional school system. At times, um, we're outvoted by right. the other town. Right. So what is the strategy you would use if you feel Millville is basically outvoted by the other town into budgets? Well, I think, it, it, yeah, at the end of the day, I think the other town comes to realize that part of their school, you know, the success they're looking for from the school depends on 
where Millville is in the process. Mm -hmm. And so Millville, I think, has more strength than you might realize mm -hmm. in the conversation. You may not have the votes if you go to a super town meeting right. and so forth, but you still have great say in that. And we, you know, I learned that very much so in Sherburne. Mm -hmm. um, we were always the poorer community, if you will, to Dover. And we were always the ones that were always in the way of achieving the educational objectives that the Dover folks wanted it see happen but at the same time when we stood our ground which we did in when i was involved um dover came to appreciate that fact in fact they were kind of oh children is being the, the cheap sons of guns is what they would say in public and then they're like oh, thankfully children's doing that mm -hmm. taking that position so we you know i think you would be surprised as i mentioned to the your search committee that how much um weight you carry in the conversation or can carry in the conversation. And part of that is to ensure that you're working well with the leadership of the schools because, you know, they're looking for educational outcomes that I think the community, everybody in the community want to benefit by, but you have to under, they have to understand the town situation. And I think the voters who are the most important people at the end of the day have to understand um, where the schools are coming from and what they're trying to achieve. And, you know, as long as there's, again, clarity, not transparency, but clarity mm -hmm. is the word I like to use, um, at least people can understand and make a better informed decision when they are at the, you know, at voting in the polling box or they're at town meeting standing up and saying yes or no on something. Um, understanding that's better. So in, in the Sherburn situation, uh, for, Four years, I went, well, three years, I went to, Sherburn has the, each town has their own elementary school. Mm -hmm. And so they had their own school committees for the elementary schools. And then the regional was the middle and the high school. I went to every school committee meeting of both school committees uh, for three years straight. Mm -hmm. Boy, I learned a lot. And I worked with uh, four superintendents and... Uh, I learned an awful lot. So I have a knowledge base that I think could be beneficial to your community. Um, I know how superintendents, I, 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 you know, I think you have, a, you have a new superintendent who looks like he's trying to achieve, you know, overcome some challenges mm -hmm. of outcomes um, in terms of graduation rates and things like that. Um, and you, you as a community are looking for realizing the investment on your dollars that you're putting in, which is, you know, the bulk of your tax dollars. Um, so everybody wants positive outcomes in that situation. Um, so what would be your approach to creating it, the town budget for the town hall, and how would you approach those uh, aspects? Well, I think you have a process that you follow that at least I'm familiar with where the department heads want to put in what their budgets are. Now, you got to, your finance committee, I think, is probably realizing the power that it has in that process. And, you know, I don't know what kind of guidance they might give out, but it, I'll give you examples in Sherman. We, we were tapping into our free cash, uh, digging into our reserves to close the deficits on our budgeting, right? And you clearly have that challenge. Um, and so our finance committee and our board of selectmen together came, came together in terms of guidance that they would provide to the budget makers and the department heads, including the, the schools, and say, this is, you know, for example, we don't want to have an override. We was something we did for a couple of years. And I'm not, you know, when there's a good reason for an override, there's a good reason for an override. But we, we knew that we thought we were achieving, we could achieve our objectives uh, without an override. And so both committees uh, were, were on board with that and gave guidance to the budget makers in terms of you're going to need to do X percent of a, an increase for this coming budget year. Please come back with your best, best approach to that. Roll it all up, see where it gets you, and um, it, it always rolls up a lot higher than you think, particularly when you get the school portion of it, and you also have to factor in you're dealing with, you know, 7% increases in your, you know, your health 
costs and you're dealing with similar types of increases in your retiree costs and so forth. So that as the pie, you're trying to limit the size of the pie, but the pieces of the pie that go to three or four places are bigger than that two and a half percent increase. So you have to be careful. And I, in your case also, it, you don't have a lot of new growth, it seems. So, you know, you don't, you can't count on that for mm -hmm. making up some of the needs. So, um, with that said, now, what, what, what was the ta tactic or what was the approach you used to get those pieces of pie or get those players to work cohesively um, to understand that, you know, this is for the overall good of, of the town and a depart every department needs to take their position or their part of responsibility to make sure that we don't end up in a situation of either using one-time funds again or, or uh, free cash and, and things like that. I'm assuming in Sherbin you probably didn't deplete all those accounts. Uh, well, we, we didn't tap into the stabilization fund like you have, but you, okay. I think you, know, you had no choice here in the most recent past because you had no free cash available. Mm -hmm. uh, we did tap into the free cash. We tapped into it much more than anybody was comfortable with a couple of years. Um, we instituted on our uh, circuit breaker monies. We used to bud not budget for the receipt of that, and it was kind of a slush fund, if mm -hmm. you will. That's mm -hmm. not the right word, but it, you know, no, but it showed that we, were, we wound up having... Um, surpluses every year and so just some would argue and I, I might have been one of those that would argue that to the extent you're generating surpluses above a certain point you're overtaxing Taxing. the citizens right yes. so we did a one year where we were we had the objective of no override we had free cash available because we had generated surpluses we also instituted and I was the architect of it of anticipating a portion of the circuit breaker monies in the budget so that that got us, you know, a slug, if you will. Yeah. Um, we were also, uh, I, was, I was on the, uh, I represented the town um, on the teacher contract negotiations and we were interest-based bargaining and we were able to get the teachers to understand, one of the important things was to understand the town's financial situation mm -hmm and the ramifications of what they were trying to achieve in the bargaining process versus what we realistically could do. And to the extent they were able to achieve what they wanted, that would mean there would be reductions in force to because to, the town was not going to support going further. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what we were able to do is talk about total compensation and things like that. We had no COLA on the steps and lanes boxes okay. for two contract years. And, you know, that was great. They had, so. The, you know, the folks on the educator side were, were supportive of what we were trying to do. And uh, likewise, on a police contract, we, you know, it's understanding where the town is and working with, the, you know, the unions and uh, right. trying to get everybody to a point that works for everybody. And uh, I, I think we, we did a good job of that. Um, Thank you. Mr. Crusoe, uh, presently you live in... Situate. Situate. That's right. That's a heck of a haul. That's a road trip. That's right. Yeah, There's I did a logistical it. challenge. I did here. that for 60 years from Dartmouth to uh, Waltham. Ah. <laughs> so I appreciate. It's an easier uh, ride this way than it would be going into Boston, yeah, sure. believe it or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. More pleasant. But at the same time, I don't know that Situate's our ultimate place. We, we used, lived in Sherburne. Situate was our summer place. Kids are out of the nest, essentially. <laughs> And my wife and I thought, well, let's go live in Situate at our summer place. And um, the winters are pretty nasty down there. Um, pretty nice in the summer. And, and we have family that are more staying in the Dover, Sherburn area. So I think our goal is to kind of get back somewhere in that corridor there. I appreciate all the material you supply. To, to this a lot, I killed a lot. Of, we killed a lot of trees, I think. Yeah. <laughs> It gave us some good information. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it truly did. Good. I was very well, appreciative of it as well. Well, I had to create it for a couple of other situations, and I thought, well, it makes sense because I've articulated things. 
It might be um, useful. <clears throat> given the uh, current makeup of, of Millville, what would you um, give an example as of uh, revenue increases without it being a burden on the taxpayers? Well, uh, I don't know that there's an easy answer to that, okay? Um, and, uh, and the reason why I say that is, again, in Sherburn, you, you know, the taxes just kept going up. And when you're paying 15 beans for the average home in Sherburn, uh -huh. that's unbelievable, right. right? And so you're looking for other ways to achieve revenue. And we're like you, there's a lot of open space that's not generating taxes. There's, uh, it's all, it's principally dependent upon, you know, ho home mm -hmm. taxes. There's no, in little or no industry. So we had three iterations of revenue generation committees, and they went out and tried to do, you know, try to come up with ideas. You know, one was the ideas committee. One was called the levitation committee. One was the revenue generation. Committee. It was all very smart people trying to come up with good solutions. So you have, I think you're leading edge here in terms of, if I understand it correctly, you have a one of those a marijuana retail operations setting up in mm -hmm. town. So you're creative in that way. Can you attract industry of a variety of sorts? Well, you're limited by your sewer and septic challenges, right. certainly. Mm -hmm. And so even, you know, in Sherburn as an example, we had uh, what was called Klein's Garage, and it Klein died, and the thing sat there in right downtown. Ultimately, it was repurposed into and redone into offices, and the intent was for um, dental offices and so forth. Turns out they couldn't do that because of the the water situation, you know, and the septic. They right. couldn't have public places for people to come and do that. But there was some re nominal retail and regular like office type stuff going on still doesn't generate a lot of revenue when right you're now. that kind of development at the end of the day. So how else do you do it? I, I don't frankly know. It depends on how much, uh, where you want to go with what you've got. I don't know enough about the land the town might have available mm -hmm. and what you want to do with it. Can you do, you know, solar farms? I always thought that was perfect for the type of place in Sherburn. You get solar farm and you generate... Mm -hmm. You know, you got this land, it's sitting there, if it's conservation land or otherwise, maybe you can generate some revenue that way. Uh, I don't know about your, no, I don't no think you're set up for windmills or water, uh, you know, uh, water mills or whatever you call them, you know, waterfall things, yeah. but uh, but you got that river going right through here. Um, you know, so I don't know what the solutions are, but I think you have opportunities to explore every possibility. Um, you know, uh, another situation in Sherburn, we, 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 uh, one of the committees brought in Pulte, the, I think the second largest home developer in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a 32 acre private parcel that somebody wanted to sell. And so they connected the seller of the parcel to Pulte. And Pulte was going to put in an over 55 development on a, you know, on a side street type of thing. But it was all well done, and it was no kids coming into the school system to up our percentage on the assessment, uh -huh. you know, from the regional thing. Yeah. And uh, it, it would have generated 750 grand net in revenue to the town. Uh -huh. um, but the abutters got together and, you know, really fought the thing and put out misinformation, quite frankly. And as a result, that thing now is ripe for a 40B project, mm -hmm. which is not a desirable outcome for a community, you know, like this either, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that was the best idea, and the, you know, they they blew it, mm -hmm. um, you know, really blew it. And could we have done a better job of trying to educate people about it. That yes, I think so. Um, but and that's the challenge, clarity. Mm -hmm. Right. Educating. And you don't want misinformation. The abutters put out a lot of misinformation, and people believed it. And then you got to get people to show up to vote. And right. it was a close call, but uh, mm -hmm. the other side won. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, what's your uh, how are you with grant writing? Uh, I, I haven't written grants. In the municipal sector. Mm -hmm. That said, I've uh, written grants for my business to the Clean Energy Center. Mm -hmm. I've 
you know, I've done, I've tried to raise money for, you know, with venture capital and business. So it, I, I don't view that as an objective. I think it's really being supportive of the various department heads. I know, for instance, in Sherman, our police chief was very active uh, submitting for and realizing some very good grants, got them some good equipment that uh, the ta taxpayers didn't have to pay for. So it was a beautiful thing. Um, we we were a green community. You're a green community. Mm -hmm. um, we ha did have a, a an energy uh, committee, if you will, um, that was always hard to staff. With you know, there were always vacancies on that committee, G but there was a good core group of people. They're the ones who submitted for a grant. We got a hundred thirty thousand dollar grant for the green communities, and then it took them forever to spend it. In the meantime, other grant opportunities passed us by, right. and so. Part of it was not, you know, somebody's got to pay it, you know, keep their eye on the ball, pay attention to when those opportunities mm -hmm. surface and do what the best you can to, to go after them. And provide the support that's right. to, to the, the groups who may have written them that may not be as well versed. That's right. I think that's where a good TA would come in, uh, you know, is to really, one, be on top of such a, the, those things, as well as be supportive of the efforts of the grant writers, to, to whomever they may be, whether they're staff or their committees. Great. Thank you. Day one, you take this appointment. I'm sorry? Day one, you take this appointment. What do you envision day one as being? Uh, uh, probably a pile of stuff to review, uh, a bunch of people to meet, uh, get out and about. Um, perhaps you don't have to go too many places around here. It's not There's only so many miles, miles in the town right? of Novo. Um, but you know, you really want to get to meet the, the folks that are doing the day to day stuff here. Um, you know, I, I put in some of my what I would do in due diligence. So day one, I wouldn't sit, be sitting in a you know, reading stuff, but I would uh, actually would hope to get some of that stuff to read beforehand. Um, and really just spend time with folks uh, so that they know, okay, there's, you know, people are going to be, am I going to like that person? What's he or she like? You know, the new, the new sheriff, if you will, in town. Um, you know, I'd want to find out what the major issues are coming forward and, you know, would look to guidance from you folks. Uh, what, are, what are your priorities? And that would help direct some of the effort. Have you uh, advanced any thought as to what your objectives might be initially, uh, from I what think, you know of the town? Yeah, I, I'd like to, you know, as I said before, to, you know, I'd want to get to interact with Keys over in Blackstone, you know, maybe go visit him, get him to buy me lunch, though. No, I wouldn't buy the lunch. Um, I was going to check on him today. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the superintendent, I think that's important. You know, in, in Sherburne, I don't think our TA's been to the schools once. That's, to me, that's crazy. Uh, I'd want to know your, your police and fire chief, which I just find that's quite fascinating that you, the gentleman's wearing two hats, but that's, I can understand One's that. One's a helmet. <laughs> One's a helmet, that's right. But, but I, you know, public safety is a very important thing. And, and driving around your town, I see it's important to some other people because we support the Millville police signs all over the place. It's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. My, my son-in-law is a policeman, so I, uh, I can appreciate the challenges they, uh, they face. I, my favorite person was the police chief in Sherburne. I really enjoyed uh, spending time with him. And we could yuck it up. We could go out for a beer together, but flip the switch when he had to be the pro, he was the pro. And you know, if I asked him a, a question of him as a pro, it was the pro I was dealing with, not my friend. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I truly respect that, so. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you. So what would be, because one of your responsibilities would be to manage the day-to-day -day tasks of the town hall, what would be your managerial style in dealing with the various departments and personnel? Um, you want people to be comfortable. You want to, um, I do management by walking around a bit so that you're meeting with, you know, that you're seeing them and you're, you know, chit chat and how's your child or whatever you're, you know, how are, how's your car running? But also it's an opportunity to, well, what are you up to at the same time you're having that conversation? Um, I think that you might 
serve well. I don't know the op, you know how things work here, but department head meetings that are you know more formalized can sometimes make sense where you're at least ensuring that everybody knows what everybody's doing again to get the oars pulling in the same direction. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not the kind of person that looks for fault. I look for how to help someone do their best mm -hmm. and give them full credit for what they're doing. And, you know, you'd be surprised. You know, I've always been surprised whatever new situation I've been involved in. Um, you know, people can tell you what, what oftentimes tell you what makes the best sense of what ought to be done. And or at least they're giving you some good guidance that you, you can get to better decision making. You can learn things quicker instead of trying to figure it out. Um, I, I think people generally, and I think in this town, from what I can tell, you have people wearing different hats, multiple hats. Um, they're probably trying to do the best for the town in spite of the impediments that they might encounter. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent you can help them do that, that's, you know, everybody wins there. So, mm -hmm. sure. Speaking of the personnel, obviously we have a very limited personnel. Right in the town hall, it's, it's limited hours. And by looking at your resume, you've held some pretty um, top management types yeah, of jobs. small companies, but yeah. So how would you feel about having to make your own copies, having to do the day-to-day, -day because it's Wednesday or Tuesday and nobody's here during the day, right. you may have to do those types of activities. What's yeah, your feeling on that? that? You know, I, I've been <clears throat> involved in startups where everybody is doing everything, mm -hmm. quite frankly. Um, my business is is me. I outsource everything, but um, so when something needs to get done, if it isn't technical, like I'm not an engineer, but, mm -hmm. uh, um, and I can't make I, I don't make things. Mm -hmm. um, but so I, I, so the answer is I yes, no problem. So you're gonna roll your sleeves up and be fine with it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And when you need to, you know where to find the people who make things. <laughs> That's right. right. That's correct. Or make things happen. That's correct. That's yes. correct. That's correct. So you talked about working with people. Um, you talked about the community um, committees for in, um, back at the um, making revenue. And you had a committee with three tiers. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So in our town, we we have a sense of there are many people who wear many hats, right. um, and we have many people who you know want to offer help. Um, but sometimes people coming to the table and being able to commit their time is very difficult. Yeah. Um, so how do we how do we because currently we have a board of assessors who is going to be non-existent soon. We have other positions that are vital to the community that are not being, despite putting it out there, despite advocating for it how do you get those individuals within the community to step to want to be part of um, the town I guess especially it, especially in like that there is little or no stipend involved right um, I, I don't know that I have an answer to that other than you, you know one of the starting points is is that people want to believe in the future of the town right mm -hmm. And so that they're making a commitment of their time and effort into something they believe in. And they don't want to feel frustrated and they want to be appreciated. And they don't want to be, you know, if they if they suggest something, it's not that, oh, you know, you, you can't shut them down. You have to let them vocalize what it is they're thinking of to see whether it might make sense. Um, you know, I, I might have written an example in some of the dead trees there. Um, you know, when I first got on the Sherburn board of selectmen, you know, people told me that one of the most important things you do as a select person is uh, you're appointing folks, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we struggle with getting people to commit. Um, but the town depends on those people, right. right? Absolutely depends on those people. So I thought, well, why don't, why are we having these people come and do it? When was the last time we met with some of these people? So we started bringing the various committees and my favorite was we had a traffic safety committee and the guy was the chairman of the traffic safety committee for 17 years and he had never been to a selectman's meeting. And, you know, we invited him. He thought, this is great. Let me tell you what we're all doing, what we're all about. And uh, it, it, it wasn't, the format was not to check in on what they're doing other than to let them 
a, you know, a dialogue of what's up and see how we can help them be more effective at what they're trying to do, as well as understand so the, you know, that the policymakers understand what's going on. Um, so if you, so if I step back, you know, outside as an out, you know, an outside observer of your town, and from what I've seen on the, you know, the YouTube videos and so forth, and um, to the extent that you can get greater trust you in clarity i go i'm going to go clarity lack I not transparency as a, a follow up question on something so i'm glad you're hitting it now um, then then you you know people may be more inclined to play on the team but there's no, i don't think there's an easy answer to how do you how do you fill the assessor's volunteer role i i don't know i mean um Part of where you start is what happened to those that were on it that aren't doing it. Why aren't they doing it anymore? Mm -hmm. To the extent you can, you have information or can find that out, that will at least help you try and make it a better uh, experience for anybody that w might want to participate. Sometimes you have to ask people. You know, there there are probably people in this community that think, oh, I might want to try and do that, but they never actually step forward. You know, if somebody in casual conversation, went to them and said, hey, you know, you have a skill set. Why don't you do that? And, uh, you know, why am I here? Because I spoke up once at a, at a, you know, finance committee advisory public hearing. I, many years ago, I went to one. I asked the question. I'm good at asking questions. And the moderator who appoints the advisory committee people cornered me and said, I want you on an advisory. And I, you know, I never thought of it, and I was like, well, hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm being asked. Somebody wants me. It's nice to be wanted, and I wound up doing it. And that was your first step and, into yeah. this Yeah, and, and I, unfortunately, I dug in deep, because that's kind of how I do stuff like that. So here I am, I want to keep doing it. Um, Do you have something? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so um, we mentioned grants before. Do you believe, um, and we have a, a budget um, deficits as well, do you believe that uh, grants could be a way to offset those deficits in the budget? I don't, I don't know that you want grants, particularly if they're one-time only types of things, mm -hmm. whether that's a solution for an ongoing budget need or appropriation need. They, they, they can, they're a stopgap measure and or they may create something. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we had, uh, what was it? We had like a, uh, it was a sailing team mm -hmm. at Dover Sherp. I mean, you know, that was one of the teams. And you know, there was a coach and the coach got paid, a coach's stipend, whatever it was. And it got pulled out of the budget by the school committee. And so, you know, parents said, we'll pay for that. And then the school committee thought, no, we don't want that one-time only type of pay. Let's revisit whether we want it in or not. And there was enough demand that they, they went back and found a home for. Um, grants are good for buying equipment. Grants are good to the extent you're desperate, I suppose, to fill the one-time gap. Mm -hmm. But I think, you, you know, you, you, you got to find ways to either do things differently and less expensively, and there's you don't have a lot of wiggle room necessarily, um, or do it better, um, is, is my take. Uh, you know, I, I'm, so I'm not a big fan of the one time only. Uh, another one was uh, my wife for a while was the, uh, the, not a school nurse, but she was the health teacher at the K through five school, you know, the elementary school. And then they took it out of the budget and they started doing a grant for it, but that didn't work long term, so they wound up putting it back in the budget. Mm -hmm. She was gone out of it by then. <laughs> Somebody else picked it up. So you've obviously been a board of selectmen before. Yep. So you've obviously had constituents come to you, to you with complaints. Yes. Um, how would you deal with being a TA and um, constituents coming with complaints about personnel to you? What would be your style of dealing with well that? if they're complaining about personnel that's uh you know that kind of opens up a, a realm of how you do things professionally mm -hmm. and confidentially and so forth so i'd be very 
careful about that. You have to be diplomatic. You, you also have to be sure that you're, to the extent that it's important to have facts, that you get facts, mm -hmm. uh, not hearsay, not speculation, not gossip or rumors. It's facts. I only, you know, let's deal with the facts. To the extent, you know, it's a challenging thing to be a sol on a board of selectmen where you're making decisions. And some people like the decisions you make, but there's always people who don't like the decisions you make. So you, you can't make people happy every time. The TA has to represent the board of selectmen mm -hmm. and represent you well, each and every one of you, you know, so that, um, and, and maybe be a buffer for you to those who aren't happy with the decision you might have made. And again, back to facts and clarity, I think, are uh, uh, ways to deal with that. Um, I don't think I'm a pushover um, to the extent, you know, there's always, in Sherburne, there were like five or six people who were constantly at the TA's door, constantly, you know, residents, mm -hmm. who were also one or two were, I would put in the realm of busybodies. And, you know, they were time wasters for him. Mm -hmm. And he, he needed to get a backbone and try to resolve the situation with those individuals on a more formalized basis and less frequent basis. And because uh, I think you could, you can get all going down a rabbit hole chasing stuff that's not doing the town uh, a good service. Mm -hmm. I have one last question. Uh, your experience in dealing with environmental issues. Uh, you, uh, we worried about water supply. We were, uh, the town of Sherburne abutted um, Framingham. Framingham, right on the town line, had a uh, uh, chemical, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a machine parts cleaning company, and it dumped the stuff into the ground after it had cleaned it. And that was starting to move into Sherbert. Likewise, at the other end of town, near where I lived, um, was a varnish factory that had long since closed, and it dumped stuff in the ground, and their plume was moving. So they were, there was constant monitoring of the plumes. There was some state involvement. There was other involvement. It impacted in the varnish one. There was a development going in, and it needed the well water. And, you know, careful monitoring of the plume was key. Uh, we didn't have waste sites per se. We had a little bit of a waste issue where the where the former dump was, landfill was, um, which became a transfer station. It had been capped. Um, there were some issues with the, what was there and whether there was anything leaching into the ground, but I think we got ahead of that. I, the key is that you get ahead of things. Um, we had a, uh, my favorite, which was when, just before Keyes got involved, and then he was involved with the aftermath. We, the town had voted when I first got on the advisory committee, I asked the then town administrator about a budget line item which had to do with the DPW garage and it dealt with water testing. And they're looking at the actuals for the prior, the current and prior years. There was zero dollars spent even though there was 1400 bucks budgeted each year. So it was like, why are we not spending? Well, we haven't done that testing in six or seven years. Well, gee, we probably ought to do that testing. Um, then we went and decided on doing a, a new garage, and the garage was going to be in tandem with the old garage being built, and all, all that sounded great, but then it turned out we couldn't put the garage where we wanted because there were VOCs in the ground because we hadn't tested for them in the prior years. And that's where Dan Keyes got hung up because he had to find, we had to go to Natick to store our equipment while we tore down the old garage and put the new one in a different spot and did remediation of of the ground underneath for the VOCs. So you've had experience. A little bit of experience, I guess, but not detailed. So to go to your time as a Board of Selectmen member or a finance committee, yep. probably more Board of Selectmen, but um, can you name a, for instance, for a, a difficult decision in which you had to make um, the you know, what that was, the ramifications and the thought process going through 
maybe a difficult or unpopular decision? Um, I was a holdout uh, for a long time, for months, on uh, putting in air conditioning, retrofitting air conditioning on a fairly new middle school building at the regional schools. And I, I insisted that we have data to support that the rooms were hot in the time periods that they were likely to use the air conditioning at the beginning of the school year and at the end of the school year. And until then, I was not supportive of, of putting that in. And they finally did come and get the data. And then I was whole heart, and they, you know, went through a lot of effort. And it was a committee that did it and volunteers. And uh, they didn't like me, but then they did like me because then I was supportive of it. And I could articulate why it made sense to the voters, and it passed. Uh, another situation was uh, that I'm actually proud of, I hope they name it after me, was an emergency access road for the elementary school. There was only one way in, one way out. And um, the, uh, one of the lieutenants in the fire department, who was a resident in town, I wrote a little bit about it, um, had pushed to have an emergency access road put in. Well, the thing morphed into a million and a half dollar project because there was going to be parking and sidewalks and lighting and you know all this sort of thing. And it, it went to town, me and I never supported that. I said, well, what is the problem we're really trying to solve? It wasn't parking and lighting and so forth, and you know, having space for people for meetings at night and whatnot. Um, and they, they came to us uh, a second time. I still didn't support it. Came to us a third time, and the third time they had three versions of the thing. So now it was like, pull it, you know, that's why I lost all my hair. You, you <laughs> couldn't understand, what, what do you want? You know, there were three iterations of it. So then I became a selectman in the very, very beginning. I went and I said to the DPW and the then TA, I said, can we do a $50,000, just, at, you know, some cut trees down, put in something on the roadway so that the fire trucks can get in and ambulance can get in, the police can get in if they had to. And we wound up with an $80,000 solution. And it got done and it's there. And, mm -hmm. you know, the superintendent, the you know, the, the school uh, principal, the police, the fire folks, all happy as get out because we got a solution. I very much understand that in that Mr. Hull and myself live on an emergency access road ah. <laughs> to the elementary school. Ah. Um, it's kept very clean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so fire apparatus and yeah, the so, such I mean, it's critical. It was critical though. I mean, we had one Get situation where a telephone pole came down in a that's winter exactly. storm. It was, you know, they are closing mm -hmm. school down. There's no way to get the kids in or out. Mm -hmm. And that school happened to be the emergency site for the town too. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you come with a lot of um, financial background with outside businesses. How is that going to transfer into the municipal side? Um, so in my business life, I've done a lot of due diligence of, you know, I've been involved in acquisitions and stuff like that. Um, so you do due diligence and whenever I go, have gone into a new opportunity, I've done due diligence. That due diligence is understanding, you know, the nuts and bolts of things as well as the operations and so forth. Um, I found it served me very well in asking the right questions of how things work and what makes sense. So, for as an example, you, what did I watch? You know, you're the the most popular TV program in town is, of course, watching you Public folks access. and the other <laughs> folks. And you know, one of the things was, and I'm going to go back to that silly word, clarity. But clarity, you you have a situation of uh, your your snow and ice issue, right? Mm -hmm. I look at that and I say, that's a great opportunity to learn something about, as well as educate people and provide clarity so that people aren't saying, why isn't there transparency? Somebody's a crook, somebody, you know, something's wrong, whatever. There's misinformation on that. But here you have, okay, we've got a, you know, somebody had, we went to town meeting, we had our best guess of uh, 123,000 or whatever it was, is the excess snow and ice. There's an opportunity to understand to help people understand how the snow and ice budgeting can be done in Massachusetts so that you, 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 know, you put in 40000 every year when you know it's going to be 100000 but you're going to 
you know, or whatever it's going to be. You don't budget the full amount. So you had to, because you didn't have your, any free cash, because, oh, by the way, your Chapter 90 funds, you're spending those before you're receiving them. Maybe there's something you want to rethink that policy. Um, but in any event, that puts you, that, and I forget what the other piece of it was, put you in a hole in your free cash. So you couldn't go to free cash to pay for the snow and ice. So you had to go to your, and it was approved at town meeting, to go to your, your stabilization fund. And so now that it's approved at town meeting, you got to pull that, um, that amount that was voted on out of the stabilization fund, even though that's not the ultimate amount that you really needed. Mm -hmm. And to your favor, you didn't need, to the 20 grand of your favor, you didn't need the full amount. Okay, but now we've tapped into our stabilization fund, so now it's easier to get at money. Well, wait a minute, if that 20 is gonna turn back into your free cash, and how do you spend free cash? Well, you vote on it. Right. So you're, you're not in such a bad situation, you're still 20 grand for the better. Yes, you want to rethink how you do Chapter 90, or at least have a discussion. Uh -huh. And you want to have a discussion about why did we think it was 123 and it was 100? Not for blame, but, you know, what were we thinking and what was the difference? And, and learn it's by not that. Like, and learn by that. That's yep. right. So that nobody's stepping on anybody's toes. That's a great example, I think. All right. Um, any experience... Um, in with uh, zoning bylaws? We, uh, the advisory committee is different than your finance committee in that it weighs in on everything, including zoning bylaws. And so we, whenever there was a change in zoning bylaws, we had to deal with it. We, our house lived across a 40B development that was developing for, it, it was 12 years before they broke ground. So I went to many zoning meetings and read the zoning bylaws and understood the zoning bylaws as well as people on the zoning board at that point. Um, so I guess I have experience. I'm not a zoning lawyer. I'm not an attorney, mm -hmm. but I can, oh, talk. Can, I can talk attorney <laughs> stuff. You know. So as, as a selectman, that zoning bylaws never came before you? Yes, or yes. Issues? So we always had to deal with them, and we appointed the zoning. But it was always also the planning board. Yes. Elected mm -hmm. folks would bring stuff. And so we either were supportive or not supportive. And, you know, part of that is that town meeting is presenting, having clear, concise presentations of what they're trying to do because it can get very, you know, dense what what – a planning board is trying to do with changing a zoning bylaw, you know, but it c can also be humorous, you know, it was, where do you put the cow, you know, the horse manure, how far <laughs> from the edge of your property can you store horse manure, you know, or from the well and so forth. Right. So you've um, went into a couple of companies to help them out when they were running a deficit. What were the approaches you took to get that to deficit to a surplus. Right. So uh, best example I went in is that I was a CPA. I went to my favorite client, which was Puma, the sneaker company. It was a $100 million company spending $130 million a year. So you can't sustain a $30 million loss for very long. Um, but I like the challenge. And um, the very f so before I went in, I asked them to print out back this back then, before you were born, perhaps. Uh -huh. um, you know, there was Green computer board. paper, Green the green board. computer paper. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I said, can you print everything out before I, you know, come in. I came into my office, and there was a, two stacks, this literally this high behind my desk of these reports. Well, the reports were only as good as, as the person looking at them, and nobody was looking at them. And I had, there were 26 people in our, what we called the MIS department at the time. And one person sole job was to walk around and hand out reports. That was the person's job. And I, uh, I did stuff like I said, that doesn't make sense, and I wonder who's looking at these. So I stopped issuing the reports, and there wasn't one person that knocked on my door and said, where's my report? Um, what that guy that hand or lady do? Well, that that was well, yeah, it was a turnaround, so we wound up making some painful decisions, yeah. and that person wasn't a keeper. <laughs> Um, nor was uh, two-thirds of that department. Um, uh, I, I, the worldwide CEO in Germany said on day one, I had to approve, pre-approve, 
every purchase of $250 or more. Now, this is a $100 million company, mm -hmm. and I'm the CFO, and I'm just starting, and I have to approve in advance any expenditure of 250 bucks. Well, I got people, uh, y you can do it the hard way or the nice way, and I, I think I did it the nice way, so people respected me and respected the fact that they knew that it was not sustainable what they were doing, and we had to get smarter about it. Mm -hmm. um, so th there's that. Uh, you know, it was also a brand thing. What what was the brand we were trying to do? We were, we were, um, you know, uh, our apparel business was a forty million dollar business losing twenty five million dollars mm. a year. It's crazy. Okay. Um, and I would go to the product development meetings and say, "Well, who's our customer?" And they would say, "Well, for the women, it's the Missies." Said, well, what the heck's a Missy? We're an athletic brand. What's uh -huh. a Missy? You know, for the men, it was, you know, it was just a guy wearing a sweatsuit to the store on Saturday morning. We're an athletic brand. That doesn't make sense. So we, we trimmed that down to authentic apparel, you know, athletic apparel. Um, uh, you know, so anyway. You, so you have to get, you know, you do your due diligence. You find out how things work. Mm -hmm. You ask questions. Um, you, you, you guys, you, you've got done some nice things. You, you, you've done the DOR has come in and done issued a report, and it looks like you've adopted many of their recommendations. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a huge step. You also have your um, your uh, what you call it, your master plan. You know, in Sherburn, we were doing a master plan for 15 years. It felt like it here. You know, but it is done. <laughs> but, but everything depended upon that master plan being done. So, you know, mm -hmm. what do we want to do on housing? What do we want to do with our land? What do we want to do? You know, all that stuff really depended on the master plan. It isn't for, for lack of effort, but it was just lack of execution. That it, you have a good one. You, you know, I, I would take the your core objectives and say, Everything you do every day, is it consistent with that? You know, that's how you do it in a turnaround. What's our mission? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If what we're doing makes sense with that, generates revenue, great. If it doesn't, we shouldn't be doing it. And you have a good master plan that's consistent, I think, with your your resources that you have here. Our planning board and uh, planner well done. did a it's nice huge. job with that. It's yes. Yeah, it's I agree. Huge. Mr. Crusoe, you've had some really good success in private companies um, turning around. Um, you've had some good success in growing within companies. What is your view on in coming into the municipal setting now? What is your idea of what you want to do in a municipal setting? The reason I like, I'm attracted to it is I got the, you know, I wrote my letter, I got the bug, and I think mm -hmm. that's the right word for it. When I was doing stuff in Sherburne, I was, you know, when I was on the advisory committee, I was probably doing five, six hundred hours a year on that stuff. Volunteer work, no stipend, mm -hmm. you know, it's just pure volunteer work. When I was on the Board of Selectmen, you can double that. And mm -hmm. again, pure volunteer work. And so I, I really dug in, I learned things. And, you know, there's there's stuff in there that I know that um, I feel I can contribute to, you know, and I, I like it. And I don't want to, you know, make widgets mm -hmm. as much anymore. Mm -hmm. And some of the other stuff, like my my youngest is graduating college with a degree in computer science. I have no clue what she does. Mm -hmm. No clue. I don't understand that stuff. Mm -hmm. you know. She show, she would ask me, what do you think of that courses I've picked for next semester? You know, I'd read the name of a course and it's like, honey, wh what is that? Well, the good thing is, is Millville is still in the, you know, the rock ages here, yeah. so, so you'll be fine. You still yeah. use DOS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, is there any other questions on from behalf of the board? Um, I, I do have um, just more of a, maybe sure. a statement or a question. I like the fact that you have a lot of financial background. Yeah. Um, granted, most of it's private. Right. I, uh, you do have the municipal side with some volunteer work. Um, obviously, this town needs a very strong finance person right. um, at the backbone. What types of things would be the first things you would be looking at financially for the town? Uh, yeah, so I asked when I first got a, a, a invited to the search committee, I wanted to see your financial statements, mm -hmm. audited financial statements, mm -hmm. to the extent you had them. Right. And you, you didn't. I guess 15 was your most recent year. Mm -hmm. 
But when I look at a town, I, I, I like to first see um, what's in the footnotes on that. Mm -hmm. right. For your uh, unfunded pension mm -hmm. and your unfunded OPEPs. Yep. And also your contribution to state retire, you know, what's contributed to the state retirement plan for the teachers. I'd like to see that. So I would want to at least get your OPEB reports, your pension report. I'd want to get, I'm sure there's, uh, the regional schools has an audit report. I'd want to see that, again, to look at that mm -hmm. side of things. Because, you know, your, your operating challenges don't even, uh, the, the, the legacy liabilities which are crushing, mm -hmm. aren't even really factored in here yet, you know. And I, you know, I think that is something I, I was pretty good. I was one of the experts in Sherburn on that. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out. Uh, so I look at that. I would, uh, <clears throat> you know, I would get to go. I would want to get to meet with the folks at the schools mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, at the superintendent and get to know the superintendent and. Uh, you know, I think I could work well with a superintendent because I, I've been in the, you know, a couple of businesses I've been involved with have involved education. Mm -hmm. And I've actually, before I went to grad school, I did some substitute teaching of math and science. And, uh, and I like, you know, so I, I get that. One of the educational companies I taught the teachers of Waltham uh, how to teach science. Mm -hmm. And, I wrote their continuing education certificates. I signed those on for for the two days that I was teaching them how to teach the science program we had developed, mm -hmm. K to eight science program. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess I'd, I I like to, and I don't think in your bylaws the TA does not sign your warrants, from what I can tell in the bylaws, or maybe the TA does. It's not. It was a vote of the board okay. to authorize, okay. but yes. Okay, because mm -hmm. that's when I was a selectman, I did that religiously. And I always, you know, in a due diligence of a turnaround or anything mm -hmm. else, you look at where the money's going, that's the best way to look at where the money's going is mm -hmm. everything that people are signing off on. So that that's key. That's where you really get a beat on. You can ask questions. You're not looking for mistakes, but, I'm, you know, be looking for understanding. Mm -hmm. And from that understanding, maybe there are, alternative, better ways of something or other um, that you can come up with. Any other? All right. Um, is there anything that you want to share with us that we may not have touched upon, but you want us to know about you or share about your experience? Uh, well, I did give you a lot of reading matter. Um, uh, that's a good question. No, I think I just think I could help you kind of bridge the gap between people that are thinking one way or are responsible for something, and certainly the board, and represent the board well in that that uh, process. Um, you can use all the help you can get when you're on a board. I can tell you that from my experience. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know about you folks. Um, I, I mentioned out there. I I do find it challenging. I'm, I'm still trying to understand how your voters can go to the polls before they've been to town meeting. Mm -hmm. Where town meeting is where they get educated about what all mm -hmm. the budgets are and all that stuff. You have your finance committee recommendations are done by town meeting, so forth. But you're asking people to do, make decisions before that. And, and so then the, the extent that what you're asking for is placeholders and get you to town meeting properly that you know that's important and it sounds like you had a little session earlier today yes, to do we that had, we which had is one good. today and it's very similar to the uh, proposals that were put forth last year I see. with multiple um, forums so. I, yeah and so you're you're selling your marketing mm -hmm. your marketing ideas if you will and and providing education to people who can then make an informed decision you know, an informed voter is the most important thing, not a misinformed one. Right. I agree. So I believe in that. All right. Excellent. That said. Yeah. Great. So um, the timeline for our board is it is on our agenda this evening to discuss candidates um, as we see as the board um, wraps up the two and yourself and another individual this evening. Um, 
and at that time, if the board opts to make a motion um, to start negotiations with an individual um, that is on the agenda, that that can happen this evening if the board desires. Um, so with that, um, probably within an email this evening, I can send you um, a note of where our board stands. Great. So by, by the time your head hits the pillow, Right. <laughs> um, I'll have a sense. Yeah, that's right. You'll have a sense of where we are and then um, very good. what goes forward yeah, from that point. Yeah, it's important to you to do the right thing for your town. I get that. It's mm -hmm. a very important decision you're all Thank you for making. So uh, I think uh, good luck to you. Then. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank your you time and the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. <clears throat> right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you too. I'm just going to say, nice meeting you. Great to see you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Good luck. Thanks. Good luck. You're rolling off, so good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we'll hold deliberations until after um, our next. Um, appointment which is at 7 15 it is 7 o'clock so um, do we need to move to break or? so what we can do is we can I, I think our next interviewer may be here so we can see if they are prepared to come in a little early we can take a five, five to fifth to meet five minute break and if our next person's ready we can start a little bit beforehand that's fine does that work for everybody okay um, and then, um, so we'll come back in about five, 10 minutes. Okay, right. thank you.